Good morning. Look at all these smiling faces here. This is wonderful. Welcome to Cardinal Stretch University. We're going to begin this morning uh, with uh, singing of the national anthem. I would ask everyone to rise. And I want to welcome our, our member of the senior class at the university, Johnny Williams, who uh, will lead us in the scene of the National Anthem. Thank you. Oh, say, can you see? Good morning again, and welcome to all of you on a very, very special day. Cardinal Stritch University is extremely honored to serve as the host for 96 candidates, their families and friends, all of whom can say that this day, December 13th, 2017, will be in so many ways the most transformative day in our lives. For today is the day that 96 of you will become United States citizens. For those of us who were born here, and have benefited all our lives from the freedoms we expect to enjoy and, and to enjoy as naturally as breathing. I invite all of us to listen very closely to the oath of allegiance that will be taken this morning by those of you who have made the very thoughtful and affirmative decision to leave one community in order to pledge your lives and devotion to another. It is a day on which any urge towards cynicism resulting from current societal events or challenges is simply washed away by the enduring sense that America is a place of hope, optimism, and a belief in our ability to realize dreams and as a community experience the better angels of our nature. It has been said that, quote, more than any other nation on earth, America has consistently drawn strength and spirit from wave after wave of immigrants. In each generation, they have proved to be the most restless, 
the most adventurous, the most innovative, the most industrious people. Bearing different memories, honoring different heritages, they have strengthened our economy, enriched our culture, renewed our promise of freedom and opportunity for all. The campus that welcomes you here today was founded in 1937 by the Sisters of St. Francis of Assisi, started by a group of very young women who themselves in 1849 left their families and all the familiar com comforts of home in Bavaria to come to America by boat and by foot to this place, to this state. This university and the legacy of the sisters welcoming you here today has been built on a number of core values that shape our work and interactions with one another each day. Showing compassion, reverencing all of creation, creating a caring community, and making peace. You could not be in a better, more welcoming place or who, a place that is absolutely thrilled and grateful for your presence here today than this university. We congratulate you. We welcome you to the community of citizens. May your lives as Americans be filled with happiness, good health, pride, and abundance of opportunities that help you realize your personal and professional dreams and the deep sense of responsibility to nurture those who choose to follow your lead. The very best to all of you. It is my great honor to introduce Judge Beth E. Hannon, who serves as the United States Bankruptcy Court, uh, as, who serves in the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Eastern District of Wisconsin. Judge Hannon will offer remarks, and she will also uh, offer and uh, administer to all of you the oath of allegiance. We'd like to welcome Judge Hannon this morning to campus. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as President Reinhardt mentioned, my name is Beth Hannon. I sit in the bankruptcy court both in Milwaukee and Green Bay. I don't get to wear a green robe when I go to Green Bay. <laughs> so today we have 96 uh, applicants for citizenship from 47 different countries. I know for some of you, the path here was not easy. Leaving your homeland, saying goodbye to family and friends is emotional. Traveling to a new country, finding a new home, finding a new job or a new school, those are all big changes. And adjusting to a new culture and a new way of life can be confusing at times. For many of you, coming here means learning a new language. But your presence and that effort are part of what makes this country so dynamic. As former First Lady Michelle Obama said last year, you are part of a proud American tradition, the infusion of new cultures, talents, and ideas, generation after generation, that has made us the greatest country on earth. In short, we are a country of people who want to be here. People who have made a conscious decision to move here from wherever they were born. Each of you brings with him or her his own background, experiences, thoughts, and opinions, which you can share with others. So we all benefit from the wisdom gained in that exchange of ideas. Some of my own ancestors came to this country from Scotland, Norway, Ireland, and Germany. My sister-in-law came here from Honduras and recently, like you, chose to become a U.S. citizen. The history of immigration to the United States is the history of the country itself. 
other than American Indians, like you, all of our families came here from someplace else. The Chicago neighborhood where I grew up was, at the time, the most ethnically diverse region in the country. It was a culturally rich, fascinating place to live. Many famous Americans over the years were born outside of the United States. Our U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chao, was born in Taiwan, coming here at the age of eight. Sergei Rachmaninoff, the composer, came here from Russia and lived in the U.S. for 25 years before becoming a citizen. Patrick Ewing, the gifted basketball player, came here from Jamaica and is now a citizen. James Kraft, the inventor of processed cheese, some of us indulge in that, came here from Canada and took the oath of allegiance, which you will take. Someone else we think about at this time of year, Frank Capra, director of It's a Wonderful Life, moved here from Italy and became a U.S. citizen. And the list goes on and on. Now you might be looking around this theater wondering, mm, I wonder where she's from. I wonder where he's from. Well, I can read off the list of countries represented here today. And when you hear your native country, please raise your hand so we can all understand a little bit about each applicant's history. Albania, Algeria, Australia, Belarus, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Brazil, Bulgaria, Burma, Cameroon, Canada, People's Republic of China, Congo Kinshasa, Denmark, Ecuador, Egypt, France, Ghana, Greece, Honduras, India, Iran, Iraq, Italy, Jamaica, Jordan, Laos, Lebanon, Liberia, Malaysia, Mali, Mexico, Nicaragua, <laughs> Pakistan, Peru, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Switzerland, Taiwan, the Gambia, Togo, Turkey, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, United Kingdom, and Vietnam. Thank you. Also here today is a representative from the U.S. Immigration Service, Officer Kay Leopold. And as part of the process, Officer Leopold has a motion to present to me. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Kay Leopold. I'm the Field Office Director for United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, Milwaukee Field Office. This morning, Your Honor, I have a motion for the admission to United States citizenship of 96 applicants for naturalization here present in the this hall. Each applicant has been found to be a person of good moral character who has resided in the United States for the period of time required by the statute. Each applicant has been found to be favorably disposed to the good order and happiness of the United States, and each is familiar with the history of the United States the principles of the Constitution and form of government of the United States. No objection to their admission has been found. Therefore, Your Honor, I respectfully move that each of the applicants present here be admitted to United States citizenship upon taking the oath of allegiance as required by the statute.
Thank you, Officer Leopold. I'm happy to grant that motion. Now, before you take the oath of allegiance to the United States, it is my job to explain to you its meaning. It has two parts. In the first part, you will absolutely and entirely renounce any allegiance and fidelity you previously had to any prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty. These words are plain. The oath means what it says. After you take the oath, you will owe all of your allegiance to the United States. The allegiance you held to the country from which you came will be destroyed as if it never existed. And any blood you may shed in the future will be American blood. But this does not mean you have to forget or deny your native heritage. Truly, one of the things that gives this country its vitality is the fact that people of so many distinct cultures and traditions live here side by side. Many immigrants to the U.S. continue to enjoy the traditions of the countries from which they came. By becoming citizens of the United States, you do not have to give up those traditions that are important to you. My great-grandparents would reserve Sundays as the day that they only spoke Scottish Gaelic in the house. And that's just an example. I'm sure you have your own rich traditions. Our country has many state and federal laws that respect and protect that kind of diversity. In America, it is illegal to discriminate against someone based on their race or nationality. And likewise, the First and Fourteenth Amendments protect our freedom to associate with whom we choose. So, I must ask you now, if any of you are unwilling to renounce your allegiance and loyalty to your former country, raise your hand now and your petition for naturalization will be withdrawn and dismissed. All right, seeing no hands raised, we'll move on to the second part of the oath. In that part, you will swear to support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The Constitution was adopted over 225 years ago. Its purpose is set forth in its preamble, which is to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty. The Constitution sets forth the principles upon which this country was founded. It establishes the three branches of our government, the legislative branch in the form of the Congress, uh, made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate, the executive branch, which is headed by the President, and the judicial branch, headed by the United States Supreme Court. At the time our Constitution was founded, or was drafted, some states of the country were concerned that the Constitution would result in tyranny of the same type they had just fought against with England. So they insisted that further language be added to prevent misconstruction of this new document or to prevent an abuse of the powers that it set forth. So Congress proposed 10 amendments to the new Constitution which we now call the Bill of Rights. In the Bill of Rights, the drafters attempted to guarantee to themselves and their children, and now to you and your children, uh, certain liberties, including freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, the freedom from imprisonment without a fair trial, etc. One of our jobs as federal judges is to make sure that those freedoms are protected and that the government does not do anything to infringe on those rights. If we conclude that you have been the victim of an unreasonable search or seizure, for example, any evidence seized by the government cannot be used against you at trial. 
In the two centuries since the Constitution was ratified, there have been occasions when the collective wisdom of the people of this country is that change is necessary, that the way things are is not acceptable. So there have been additional amendments to the Constitution that established new civil rights that we believe are fair and just. In 1865, for example, near the conclusion of the Civil War, the 13th Amendment was adopted, outlawing slavery. In 1870, the 15th Amendment was passed, giving black men the right to vote. In 1920, women were given the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment. So if you're doing the math, you'll realize it took over 130 years before the collective wisdom of the nation was that women should have the right to vote. But the basic principles of the Constitution have endured, even though at times there have been debate and argument over what those principles mean. The doctrines contained in the Constitution have allowed this country to transition from what was largely an agricultural society into an industrial world power. When the Constitution was written, there were no gasoline-powered engines, no electricity, no airplanes or drones, no phones of any type, certainly no internet. Think of how much the world has changed just in your own lifetimes. When the Bill of Rights drafters wrote that people shall not be subject to unreasonable searches and seizures, they were thinking about searches of cabins, barns, clothing. They weren't thinking about searches of your smart car or your cell phone or your iPad. But those same rights and protections provided for over 200 years ago are simple enough and basic enough that they apply just as much today as they did when written. So imagine the challenge of writing a document that can withstand the test of time and unknown changes which are surely to come in the future. Our Constitution has proven to be a truly tenacious document. By taking your oath today, you join the millions of citizens of this country and promising to support and defend the principles set forth in the Constitution, no matter what it might cost you. A cousin of my great-grandfather served the Northern troops as a scout in the Civil War, and he is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. He died defending the principles set forth in the Constitution. My mother's father served in the Army in World War I, and both my father and father-in-law served our country in World War II. In the United States, we celebrate Memorial Day, where we honor men and women, like my Uncle Richard, who died while serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. Hopefully not, but someday you, like I, may be called upon to defend the Constitution and the United States against an attack. And by taking this oath, you agree that you will do so if asked. But without taking up arms, you can defend the Constitution every day by living honorably, even if some around you do not. Be a model for that. The Constitution provides you with civil liberties and privileges, but not guarantees. There are no guarantees. The American dream is the belief that through hard work and determination, anyone, including any naturalized citizen, can achieve a better life, usually in terms of financial prosperity and enhanced freedoms. But there is no guarantee of happiness. There is no guarantee of success. Those you have to gain on your own. But the government won't get in your way. Great examples of improved circumstances can be found by looking at the lives of those persons I mentioned earlier. Most of them did not come to the United States already rich and successful, but through hard work and determination, 
and often a little ingenuity, they were able to achieve success. Earlier this year, excuse me, our present First Lady, Melania Trump, spoke to young people at a ceremony recognizing International Women of Courage. She said, remind yourself that you too are capable of greatness. I urge you not to be afraid to fail, as failure will never have the power to define you as long as you learn from it. The nitty gritty is that the United States is not a perfect country. It has too many entrenched poor, its prisons are overcrowded, too many people are without jobs, and sexism and racism remain widespread. One of my favorite bishops observed, our culture has been a paradox of both welcome and prejudice. But I'm old enough to have seen that collectively, Americans are trying to address these and other issues and make them better. You all have had the benefit of viewing the United States from the outside, so to speak. You might have very different opinions from those of us who've only seen it from the inside. You've obviously concluded that you want to be U.S. citizens, and we're very happy about that. But as new citizens, if you disagree with something the government is doing, you can voice your opinion and work for change. Respectful disagreement can be messy, but fruitful. Change seldom happens overnight. Being a United States citizen means that you are free. You are free to think on your own, free to form your own opinions, say what you want to say, even if what you have to say is unpopular. You are free to work where you want to work, to read what you want to read, to believe what you want to believe, to openly practice any religion or no religion at all. No doubt with those freedoms comes responsibility. It is the responsibility to participate in the democratic process by voting, not casually, but in a thoughtful and informed way. You have a responsibility to educate yourselves so that you can make wise choices. Our democracy only works when its citizens participate fully by helping to select those who govern us all and by taking that process seriously. Many states even have rules on write-in votes. By taking this oath today, you all will have the right to vote. And I hope you take advantage of that very precious right. So, at this time, I'd ask each of the applicants to stand to take the formal oath of allegiance. Each of you please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty, of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform non-combatant service 
in the armed forces of the United States, when required by the law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction, when required by the law, and that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God. Let me be the first to congratulate you all on becoming citizens of the United States of America. filled 
with challenges that you know how to manage, that you learn to overcome, with happiness at being citizens of this country, with uh, the opportunity, many opportunities, to really not only identify your dreams, but also find those ways and support and people around you who are ready and willing and able to help you fulfill them. Uh, may the oath that you take today, may you be mindful of it every day, and may all of us who joined you today in support of this oath be very mindful of everything that has come to us so naturally simply by being born, but that we take the time and opportunity to think long and hard about what it takes to form the type of community that is prized around the world as a remarkably special place. And so we want to uh, wish you the very best. Uh, this is a community that wishes the very best to everyone who comes here, to, every, to participate either on campus activities or to be part of the Stritch community. And we send you off with all of the best wishes that this community has to offer. And enjoy the rest of the day. And all the best to you in every day of your life ahead. Thank you so much.
Just in case they come back. Thank you. 